Welcome back to today's annual conference from the Forum for the Future of Agriculture. We hope you've enjoyed the break that we've just had over the last hour or so. If you're joining us for the first time today, you are very welcome. Um, it's been great to see all the interactions that have been taking place in the exhibition space and in the networking lounges over the last hour. We hope that that leaves you uh, stimulated with ideas and thinking on how we renew the food and agriculture system. And of course, uh, we had our terrific opening keynote address from the FAO Director General, uh, who told us that we should dream and do, and that seems apt as we go in to our second panel session of this morning, making the food system climate resilient. Now, as we do so, we uh, continue to encourage you to use that box that's just underneath your screen there, where you can type in your name and share with us your comments and questions that Stephen will use to drive the next discussion amongst our panelists. You can also follow us on social media. The, the handle for Twitter is Forum for Ag and on Facebook, Forum for Agriculture. Do take that up as and when you can. Well, that's it from me. I shall now hand over and leave you in Stephen's very capable hands. Stephen. Yeah, Mark, thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me just reiterate what Mark said. I do want you over the next hour and a half or so to give me your questions, your thoughts on the platform, because uh, frankly, I have little doubt that your questions will be better than mine. Uh, and I want you to help me really make this uh, next session, which is focused on making food systems uh, climate change resilient, I, I want to make sure it really does engage all of us uh, in a very sort of creative and proactive way. So get those questions to me on the platform. I will see them on various screens I have around me uh, and I will put them to our guests. Now, we're going to have a, a terrific panel uh, representing different, and I hate the word, but I'm going to use it, stakeholders uh, in this discussion. We are going to be talking to people from uh, the corporate sector, from the farming sector, from policy making, from think tank NGO perspectives as well. So we've got that panel to look forward to. But before we get to the panel, we have another keynote speaker for me to introduce to you. Uh, she brings a wealth of experience to this discussion of global food systems, climate change, the challenges, the threats, the reality that some parts of the world are more threatened than others, some parts of the world much better equipped to deal with climate change challenges than other parts of the world. She truly brings a global perspective to this. She is Catherine uh, Bertini. Now, Catherine currently is a distinguished fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She's a former executive director of the World Food Program. In years gone by, she actually won the World Food Prize uh, some 16 or 17 years ago. She brings a wealth of experience to this. She couldn't join us live, but she has, I'm delighted to say, uh, given us her thoughts in a presentation that she recorded from her home in Chicago. So let's have a listen right now. Today, the world faces unimaginable challenges from climate issues, hunger, poverty, migration, and of course, the pandemic. The most vulnerable in our communities have been on the front lines of these crises for decades. Underserved communities struggle. Farmers have experienced increasingly extreme weather, which hampers harvests and food supplies. Women are especially challenged as they try to feed and nourish their families. It's exciting for me to be here today to talk about making meaningful progress toward our collective future. As leaders who are passionate about addressing these issues, we must act. We must work together better to create healthy, nutritious, sustainable, climate resilient, and robust food systems that can last for decades even centuries. We especially must create systems that serve all people. It's well known that our agriculture system is designed for maximum output from a few high profit crops. This is important, but we have to go beyond it. We have to address the sustainability, the availability, the equity, the nutrition, and the health benefits of the food that we grow and the food that we consume. And of course, agriculture must face these issues also. 
farmers, processors, distributors, and consumers like you and me. All must prioritize the purpose of food and the imperative for adequate, safe nutrition for all. With additional system change, the agriculture and the food system, and I would add the health system that it supports could become a net positive. For example, from the agriculture perspective, by sequestering more carbon that the industry creates, we could help to mitigate this march toward irreversible damage. But this requires a global effort. As we've seen with disease, with natural disasters, with climate challenges, they do not recognize borders. High-income countries have faced multiple once-in-a-century crises in 2020. Low-income and middle countries have, middle income countries have also been hit hard, but they lack the safety nets, the infrastructure, and the funding to rebuild quickly. We know that the consequences of extreme events can linger for decades. And we know we must invest in the future of low and middle income countries to diminish this impact and to help them prepare for the future. The frequency and the magnitude of natural disasters has been increasing dramatically. Cyclones and drought have all increased due to the impact of the changing climate. Temperature and rainfall have become increasingly variable wrecking havoc on the best laid plans of farmers, women and men all around the world. Agricultural pests and pathogens continue to remain a threat. This has been demonstrated by the locust pl plaguing East Africa and the Middle East and the global spread of African swine fever, which in 2019 claimed one quarter of the world's swine population. The COVID-19 pandemic laid on top of that impacts each one of us. Climate resilient agriculture is about more than food security. I understand later that Vanessa Nakate will elaborate on her fight for food security and climate justice and what that means for her country. We must support leaders like Vanessa all over the world. Effective leadership is a key to our collective success. During my 10 years as executive director of the UN World Food Program, I learned the importance of leadership at every level. Leaders must be prepared, interactive, strategic, creative, goal-oriented, and personally engaging. They must juggle a complicated morass of interlocking ecosystems with competing priorities. They must exist and we must develop and train them at every level, from family to community, to region, to country, indeed, to the world. You know, it used to be that a simple discovery of new techniques or technologies almost automatically built sustainability. But we've learned that that's not enough. Leadership, effective leadership is critical to success. Let's consider that these challenges that we're facing are really opportunities. Opportunities to create a long lasting, sustainable agricultural system that can operate for decades to come. We have to listen to people and their needs. We have to empower people. We have to develop leaders. And when we do that, and when we work together, we can turn our current problems into solutions, making those problems now achievable opportunities within our lifetime. At the Forum for the Future of Agriculture today, I am one of many here to contribute to the dialogue between stakeholders of our food and agriculture system so that we can foster the changes that must be made to create climate resilient agriculture and to make it the norm. During this session, I'm confident that the distinguished speakers taking part will be able to showcase that climate resilient agriculture 
is possible and well within our reach. So long as we align ourselves on local, regional, national, and global levels. So long as we listen to and include the voices of women, as long as we develop leadership at all levels, as long as we're inclusive, as long as we remember our message, our mission to provide accessible, adequate, safe nutrition for every person on earth. Thank you, FFA 2021. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this year's annual conference on food system renewal. And thank you for your continuing efforts and those of everyone here to establish an inclusive dialogue where farmers, policymakers, agriculturalists, environmentalists, health professionals, nutritionists, and regular consumers can plan our future together in Europe, in every region, and throughout the globe. Thank you. Catherine Bertini there with her thoughts. It's great to hear from a World Food Prize winner at the beginning of this discussion. And uh, Catherine just emphasized that all of the different people with a stake in this discussion need to be brought together and to work together, not just uh, with the rhetoric and the talk, but with real action. So let's see if over the next uh, hour or so we can convince ourselves that that is a real possibility. To do it, we need a panel which brings together expertise from different uh, sides of this debate. And I'm delighted to say that's exactly what we've got. So what I'm going to do now is introduce to you our panel members. And uh, panelists, we can see you on a screen now. So I want you just to raise a hand and give a friendly wave when I mention your name, because then everybody around the world is going to be clear who is who. So in no order at all, let us welcome Benedict uh, Bursel, who is CEO and founder of Guten Bursel, which is a big farming enterprise. Eric Fierwald, who is uh, the CEO of Syngenta Group. Marion Janssen, Director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate at the OECD in Paris. And Karina uh, Millstone, who is Executive Director of Feedback Global, and Karina has a long re track record in academia and NGOs, including, I think, a, a marvelous scheme to uh, build or create orchards in urban areas across the world. So a terrific panel with a lot of different experience. Uh, panelists, I want you first to reflect on the big theme and on the way it was laid out by Catherine Bertini. She was emphasizing inclusivity, the responsibility of all the different stakeholders to actually make real commitment right now. So uh, Benedict Bursel, I'm going to start with you. You're a farmer. You're sort of a technologist as well. Tell me how you believe farmers can be a hugely significant part of this broader discussion. Um, well, to be honest with you, I think they are the only solution and, and the only people that can actually do it. So I think, you know, currently what we, what we experience is a lot of chat about this topic. And um, going back to the statement, it is quite beautiful to see that we seem to have understood that agriculture is potentially the biggest solution to many of the big problems that we are facing in the world. I think that for itself already is something that we have worked for and, and we are now able to talk about how that can be basically laid out in, in terms of solutions. But I think what is important to understand is that the only people who can actually do the change and do what we all want them to do is the farmers. So it's not really about what can the farmers do for us with regards to health, biodiversity, climate adaptation, but it's what can we do for the farmers. And to give you a bit more perspective on this, I think it is important to understand many of the situations that, that farmers are in. And of course, they're very heterogeneous, so it's difficult to basically throw them in a pot. But as far as I can tell, there's really three different forms that farmers are in at this point. They're either, you know, having difficulties earning an, uh, an income as it is, so they're fighting or struggling to survive day in, day out. So we cannot expect them to make the change. Volker Engelsmann, the CEO of Fayosta, always says, you cannot think green if your figures are red. 
That is one part. The other part is in certain areas in the world, having great soil, the right amount of rain, and then on top of that might even get subsidies. So these group or this group is not is earning you know enough money they're having a good life why would they have to change and the 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 huge middle part and i think that's the most important one they are stuck in a system they are already trying to develop they are already testing new methodologies but they cannot get out of it because they are not independent anymore they are too strongly in debt they have decided on certain specializations which now is difficult to get out of and of course the the emotional side of it also plays a huge role. So I think we have to consider those different um, situations that the people are in. And let the question me, becomes, how let can let we do the minute. systematic let change me. that we need? Benedict, and that, me. for let me, can only come through empowering the independent pioneers that actually show on the farm level what is possible and how it can be achieved. And we also have to make sure that we have problem-oriented research because education is key. We need the education to help farmers to actually find ways of working more in line with nature, becoming less dependent and hopefully also driving down debt. And I think there is basically one very important part of that, that is true cost accounting. We need to be able to, on one side, monetize and monitor the costs of production with regards to ecosystem, to health, the rural community and so forth, but also we have to be able to value the, the actual values that are being created, water retention, biodiversity, nutrient density in food and so forth. I think only then do we have the tools in order to compare different ways of, of, of doing uh, farming in, in different areas. So I think what is incredibly important at the end of the day is the question, how can we get young people on the farm and on the land? And for me, there's only one way that is healthy ecosystems. It is affordable land. It is the right education at the right time. And it is not companies that are getting more and more control, making farmers more and more dependent and having on their sole propriety profit maximization. I think we need to value ecosystem functions and social um, matters just as much as we do all the others. Um, so I'm grateful for the invitation and happy um, in this group um, because I absolutely agree the only way how we can do it is together and in a positive narrative. Um, but that means we all have to take a step back and look at our values. But I think we're getting there. Benedict, thank you very much. And I want to move on to the rest of the panel in just a moment. But before I do, I I'm just intrigued to know which group of farmers you put yourself in. You describe some farmers who are very happy with the status quo, others who would like to make a change but economically find it very difficult. And then there's a group of farmers who, frankly, are just m more concerned about subsistence and eking out a living than anything else. I I I'm guessing you put yourself in, in, well, either group one or group two. But just explain to me which group you're in and whether you feel as a farmer that you have anything in common with farmers in the developing world, in economies which are really challenging and struggling, where the, the context is so very different from your own? I mean, that's a great question. And, and to be honest with you, with regards to those groups, I can tell you straight away, I am in the, in the bracket that is struggling to survive every day. We have... Uh, sandy soil and incredibly low precipitation in, in, in our area. So we, are, we have to fight each day, uh, day in, day out. And, you know, on top of that, we are faced with Corona. We have uh, African swine flu. We have bird flu. We have uh, the third year of drought. So I know what it feels like to, to you know, having, <laughs> having problems to sleep, being responsible for, for 30 plus families. Um, and this is the reason why I care so much. This is the reason why I do everything that I do and why I risk everything that I have in order to find solutions and offer ways of, of getting out of this. And with regards to the second part of the question, you, you, you're completely right. I mean, I live in my bubble, of course, and it's still an incredibly privileged bubble. I am aware of that. Um, but I think where we all kind of connect as far as farmers is concerned is that we are uh, on the bottom of a pyramid, but the pyramid is upside down. So we have all the risks, we have all the worries, we have no chance of 
doing anything but trying to get what we can in terms of inputs and machines and so forth and hoping for nature to somehow support us. And any company, any, um, any association, any political law is put upon us and we have no power in, in, in addressing that somehow. So I think what is just so incredibly important and I cannot stress this enough is we have to, you know, instead of saying farmers should be doing this or farmers should be doing that or why don't they also do this, we have to say, oh my God, thank you guys so much. What, what do you need from us? You, you need education, you need capital, you can have it all because you are the solution to a healthy ecosystem in the future and no one else really. Okay, well that, that's a terrific opening, Benedict. Thank you very much. I, I wanna bring Marion Janssen in now. Marion, there you are at the OC, OECD, which uh, people will be familiar with for the economic reporting you do. Uh, essentially, uh, a, a membership group which is of, of the more prosperous and developed world countries than of the poorer developing world countries. You've just heard the message from Benedict that Farmers bear all of the burden, all of the responsibility, have such a dominantly important place in the food, global food system, uh, but aren't, you know, in a position to engineer transformation. They need help, and they need help particularly from political leadership, from big corporates as well. Tell me from your perspective at the OECD whether the system is working, particularly with, with regard to our conversation topic today, which is linking food system renewal to recognition of the climate change challenge. Uh, you know, our governments, uh, is the corporate sector stepping up here and, and helping farmers in the way that, that Benedict hopes they will? Um. No, I, I think uh, our organization is an international organization, so I have to give diplomatic answers. So my diplomatic answer is uh, the system hasn't been working that badly, but can be improved. There are definitely challenges um, ahead. And uh, we take these challenges very seriously. Um, that's why we have um, a directorate that uh, has a strong focus on agricultural policies. That's why we have been collecting for decades information on um, government support to the private sector, trying to uh, to the agricultural sector, trying to understand whether it is helping farmers or rather distorting competition. And uh, this, is, this is why a lot of our work in this year has been focusing on food systems and how to make them work better. Now, Benedict has um, talked a lot about one of the challenges that we look at under this uh, food systems work. It's the challenge to guarantee incomes for farmers, for those living off the farm. But we are seeing two additional challenges. One is to make farming so, uh, environmentally sustainable. And that may sometimes lead to additional costs for farmers. That's some, one of the things that uh, Benedict is maybe struggling with. And that's not everything. Incomes for farmers, second challenge, environmental sustainability, and third, at a global level, we need to provide sufficient nutrition and quality nutrition to a growing population. Now, three objectives, that's a complex. Three objectives you typically cannot meet with one policy. You typically need a policy mix. Um, we would typically want to think of a mix of three policies, three challenges, three policies, uh, but even that is too easy. And then you have to make those policies work along the value chain, as has been said in the introductory uh, video. This has to uh, set the right incentives, not only for producers, but also uh, for distribution and for consumption at the at the end. So we are in a complex setting, in particular if you keep in mind that some, not all the policies will be managed by one ministry, sometimes multiple ministries are involved, and that's what makes it difficult to design the right policies. I told you I've been discussing, collecting information on um, producer support to agriculture for three decades. For three decades we have been saying the support is too high and in particular it's too distortive. And unfortunately, the adjustment has happened, but um, we believe too slowly. I mean, in the EU in particular, in decades gone by, there's been a feeling that, that uh, the, the system of supports and subsidies does not really work in the interests of anybody. Farmers are generally often quite unhappy with it, but the general public and the taxpayers are even more unhappy with it and feel that 
it, frankly, it, it, it's skewed towards the interests of a small part of the population involved in the rural economy and food production. Do you get a sense the EU now has a much clearer headed approach to food system issues, where to put support to make it both uh, more sort of creative and also addressing the very particular challenge of sustainability and climate change? No, for a long time indeed, a lot of the policies that were Im implemented in the EU, but also in other OECD members, were what we would call lose-lose. Uh, they wouldn't uh, raise incomes of farmers and they would not support the environment. So there was definitely room for a lot of improvement there. In 2020, we estimate that uh, producer support to the agricultural sector was in the, of the magnitude of 700 billion US dollars. And the majority of this was both distortive, so distorting competition and not necessarily helping the incomes of farmers. So it's not the kind of pol policy you want. Definitely in many countries, um, and uh, the EU is taking um, an important lead role there, the emphasis on environmental sustainability has increased. There is an acknowledgement that uh, the climate risk is becoming more and more important for farmers like Benedict, but also for farmers in the developing world and ultimately uh, for those of us living in our countries. So something has to be done to address this and it has to happen rapidly. At the OECD, we support our member countries in this change. Right, well, thank you very, very much indeed for that, Marion. I wanna to turn to Karina now. Karina, you've got a long career in academia and think tank work. You, you take a, a global perspective on this. So I, I want you to tell me what you think when we're talking about food systems and the challenge of, of climate change, meeting that challenge, what you think is the most important message that you want to get across today? Yes, I mean, I think um, I really welcome Catherine's intervention and a point I, I noted, she, she mentioned that the agricultural system has been designed with maximum output of a few high profit crops in mind. It is time for a change. And for me, that's really powerful because she really gets the root cause of the unsustainability of our food system here, in my view, which is corporate control. And essentially a, a food system that's arranged around the, the enabling of corporate profit as its guiding uh, principle. Uh, and in my view, what this does, it ends up trumping all other considerations, including uh, environmental impacts, including good nutrition, the so-called externalities of, of uh, in, in the corporate talk. Um, and really that precludes a food system geared towards other goals and the goals that we, we all know we want. We all want, you know, we want uh, better nutrition. We want uh, ecological renewal, uh, restoration and, and a stable climate. So for me, the critical shift that needs to happen, the main barrier here is, uh, is this move away from the, kind of the corporate profit paradigm uh, as the organizing principle towards a new principle, uh, one where the food system is geared towards delivering secure nutrition, good nutrition for all, while minimizing environmental impact and better still, environmental enhancement. And so if we move towards that principle, we would want decision makers, we want policies and incentives towards that mechanism, rather than the current setup that we have, which is the policies and mechanisms uh, that enable uh, corporations to, to externalize these environmental and social impacts with, with impunity. Uh, so for me, that's really the missing piece here, that, you know, this, this recognition that uh, what, we, what is grown, uh, what is eaten, uh, our food culture, uh, it are really shaped uh, by, by, a few, by a few multinational corporations uh, that are not necessarily delivering the good nutrition uh, that we need uh, while, while, in, while enhancing the, the natural world. But Karina, if I'm to take your argument to its extreme, you seem to be saying that uh, capitalism cannot and will not deliver the sustainable food systems that the planet needs. I, is that your conclusion? Because if that's the conclusion, it means... Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, I'm not sure we need a revolution, but we certainly need uh, a transition to a post 
capitalist post-corporate economic system. Uh, that is true throughout the economy. This is the root cause ultimately uh, of uh, you know, economic growth being the root cause of environmental degradation and climate change. It's even more true in the food system, uh, I would say, where the urgency is the greatest. Um, Take one example, the meat sector. We know we need to massively reduce our meat consumption. This is not a controversial position. The IPCC agrees on this. The Eat Lancet reports agrees on this. Uh, and yet, uh, meat is currently chiefly produced by 35 uh, meat corporations that all have growth ambitions uh, since they are largely uh, publicly traded. They have responsibilities to their shareholders. And we know that the growth trajectory of those corporations puts us on a collision path uh, with a stable climate and biodiversity preservation. So, uh, so yes, <laughs> this is exactly what I'm saying, uh, that there is this inherent tension between the, the capitalist uh, corporate profit motive uh, and, and, you know, and good nutrition and, of course, uh, restoring remaining ecosystems and stabilizing the climate. That is what I'm saying. Uh, yes. Yeah, K K <laughs> Karina, you, I, I, I love it. I, you, you, you don't know this because you can't see the multi-screen I've got, but on our multi-screen right above you uh, is a representative of this corporate world with which you have such a problem. Uh, Eric uh, Fierwald has been waiting patiently for his contribution. He, of course, is the CEO of Syngenta Group. And Eric, it's uh, a pleasure to have you join our panel, and I'm sure you were listening very, very carefully to what Karina was just saying. I put it to you, uh, thanks to Karina's contribution, that you and big uh, agribusiness corporations such as Syngenta are a fundamental part of the problem, not the solution. Well, I would say that it requires massive innovation to solve these major challenges for the world. And I think private enterprise, together with NGOs, together with governments, all helping farmers, as Benedict talked about, we must help farmers to be the solution. And I think we all have an important role to do that. But uh, let, let me talk about food systems, because I, like Catherine and, and like Dr. Chu before her, believe that food systems must adapt in a major way to make sure there's enough food for everybody, despite the impact of climate change. And, and, and let me tell you, this is not some future threat we're talking about here. We are already seeing record heat, droughts, and flooding, and more frequent storms than we've ever seen before. And these are challenging the ability of farmers everywhere to grow enough healthy food in a safe, environmentally friendly way. And we need innovations to help them. So let me give you a couple of examples. In September 2019, I was visiting our Fields of Innovation event in the Netherlands, where much of the world's vegetables and flowers are grown. One farmer came up to me, his name was Thomas, and told me that he had a problem with an insect that he had never seen before eating his tomatoes. He showed the insect to me and said that the Syngenta agronomist who shared a picture of the small white fly with our, with our global network was able to figure out from our experts in South America that it was a tuta absoluta fly, something that came from Central America that had never been seen in the Netherlands because of winters that had, had stopped their progression. But now with global warming, these and other pet pests are moving further and further north. Another example is fall armyworm, an insect that's devastating to maize and in other crops, and it's now widespread in China. It was never there before until two years ago. And then finally, yesterday, I was on a Zoom call with a U.S. farmer telling me about the horrendous drought challenges in the U.S. western states, and these are causing record forest fires. It's only springtime, and he worries about the viability of his farm and needs our help and the help of others. In Australia now, which has seen the worst drought in history, it now sees horrific flooding, and it's just incredible what farmers have to face. So this is a real threat, not just to farmers' livelihoods, but to our global food supply. And the vulnerability of the food supply was highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And by the way, in the last year, the average grain prices are up 40%, which especially is difficult for the poor. Now, the agriculture model we have used so far is not sustainable because of these weather extremes. 
And also, agriculture is responsible for 12% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And this needs to be decreased by at least 50% by 2030, so we in agriculture can help achieve the Paris Agreement goals. Now, fortunately, history shows us that agriculture is up to big challenges. Once highly inefficient and unpredictable, farming has been revolutionized by innovation with major advances in seeds, crop nutrition, and crop protection over the last 60 years. Since 1960, food production has more than tripled, while land use is up only 13%. And pesticide use on farmland has fallen by 95%, thanks to safer, more effective pest control solutions. And today, agriculture is one of the few sectors that can make a choice to go from being a net emitter of carbon to becoming a net sequesterer. So we believe in regenerative agriculture, which some call nature positive agriculture. And this is an approach to, to, to not just bring specific technologies, but farming practices that help achieve the outcomes we all want. And these outcomes include higher yields, so we don't need as much land, capturing carbon in the soil, of course, protecting biodiversity, reducing irrigated water in water limited areas, and continuing to reduce the volume of crop protection products and fertilizer. Now the practices I'm talking about include low or no-till farming, enabled by modern seeds and herbicides to control weeds. This keeps carbon in the soil, helps the soil better hold water, and enriches it by diversifying its microorganisms, building healthier, nutrient-rich soils. Another practice is using cover crops between seasons, which also increases carbon in the soil and better protects it from erosion during off-season. Improved crop rotations can also help replenish soil to keep it healthy. And while these types of practices are not new in themselves, when we put them together with the right seeds, crop nutrition, and crop protection products, both synthetic chemistry and new biologicals, as well as with digital tools, we can achieve the outcomes we want. And this is why Syngenta has committed investing $2 billion in regenerative agriculture breakthroughs over five years. But we also need forward-thinking agriculture policies like building carbon credit markets that reward farmers for outcomes they achieve by adopting climate-friendly practices. Then we can not only reduce agriculture's net emissions, but potentially reverse them. And by making agriculture more sustainable, we can feed the world and be an important part of the solution to climate change. We can do this, but we need to do it all together, and we need to bring more and more innovation to agriculture. Phrases like uh, nature positive agriculture, they, they slip off the tongue really well and they sound terrific, but um, Karina's point was that in the end, your prime motive is to serve your shareholders and maximize profit. And to maximize profit, you, you constantly need to be encouraging farmers uh, to use inputs that are based on your products. And, and for many of us, it's a little difficult to believe that you're quite as sort of holistic and selfless as a corporation as you've just described yourself. Why should we believe that you are prepared maybe even to jeopardize the interests of your shareholders to be part of this collective effort to find a more sustainable agriculture? The mission of the Syngenta Group is one thing. It's to help farmers safely feed the world and take care of our planet. That is what we're all about. And let me give you one example. So we're in the crop protection business, the pesticide business. Over the last 60 years, we have reduced the volume of pesticides per hectare of land by 95%, bringing out better and better chemistries. We're gonna do that again in the next 10 years. And we're gonna do that through better chemistry, through complementary biologicals, and through things like imaging, where you tell where the pests are and you spray only where the pests are and not broadly. I'm telling you, we care about the environment. We care about helping farmers protect the environment. It's the only environment we have. There's no planet B. 
we, that we, we have to protect this world and we have to feed a growing population and we want to do it with less land. So we stop deforestation and reforest land instead of needing more farmland to feed a growing population. So those are our commitments. That's what 49,000 people of Syngenta wake up every morning to do. We've got 4,000 agronomists that are out there in the field. Their only job is to help farmers be successful. And where they use our products, it's great. And we keep coming out with new innovations. But our goal is to help farmers feed the world and take care of our environment. All right, very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to take a very quick time out to remind you all, and we have got some questions coming in, but we want more. So uh, ask the questions using the question box on the platform that you're all using today. There is a question box there. Uh, you can also ask questions via Twitter. Just use the hashtag FFA2021, and that will get you to a place where you, well, you can just use that to, to ask a question. It'll be picked up by the team here who are monitoring Twitter. So um, I'm going to continue my questioning of our four great panelists, but I'm also very keen to uh, engage with everybody so that everybody's got a chance to chip in. So I'm going to take a couple of questions right now. First question that's come up uh, on our screens is this one. Um, panelists, listen to this very carefully. Uh, the question is, given that consumers face very limited choices in many cases when it comes to food, mainly determined by supermarket buyers, what can individual consumers realistically do to reduce their CO2 footprint when it comes to food? It, it's interesting because so far we've discussed you know, the different elements of this uh, sustainable agriculture debate. We've discussed it in terms of the farmers, uh, where we've got Benedict. We've discussed it in terms of policymakers and government. We've discussed it in terms of the big corporations. We haven't actually talked about you and me, ordinary members of the public and consumers, and how the consumers fit into this whole debate about a more sustainable food system. So, Benedict, I'm going to come back to you. You're a farmer. You're producing food. You obviously have to think about the way food is consumed as well, because that's your marketplace. What do you think consumers should be thinking and doing as we talk about more sustainable food systems? Um, thank you for the question. Before I answer that, I have to go back, unfortunately, to what Eric said, because I can't uh, leave it hanging in the room. Um, first of all, I, I was actually quite disappointed by, by, by the statement because, of course, you know all the right words and you mentioned them beautifully and cover crops are a great thing. But And I could go into detail for hours and hours of many of the things that you mentioned. Um, and as I said, not from, from a positive point of view, but from a very critical one. But just one thing to clarify, um, if you talk about helping farmers, um, helping means you give something for free. You try to solve a problem with something. If you let someone pay for help, it's not help, it's selling a product, right? That just as a, as a standard uh, to, to get that right. Um, apart from that, um, I think, you know, as far as the consumer is concerned, um, it really depends. I think what technology does bring, as, at least in, in, in some parts of the world, is that you are able to really get all the information that you need in order to take a dis the, the informed decision. So what does food have an influence on my health and the health of my family? Well, how does the, the way this food has been produced relate to, let's say, the nutritional benefits of that food? And has that way of production had an influence on the livelihood of the farmer or the livelihood of the rural population? And if I do care about sustainability, if I do care about biodiversity and so forth, then I can use that information to try to support products that are in line with my value and belief system, right? And I mean, I am aware that this is also, in a sense, a privileged discussion, but it has to start somewhere. And we, let's say, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, we have the possibility to take that um, transfer, that, that informed decision and thus support farmers and, and communities that are farming with nature, increasing biodiversity, increasing um, carbon in the soil, and thereby producing food that is very nutritious. And they do that not by massive innovation from the industry, but they do that because they understand 
the complexity of ecosystems and they understand that they have to close the nutrient cycles to have less chemical inputs. But uh, just, just as a point of detail, Benedict, do you produce uh, uh, good in Bursel? Do you produce livestock, uh, meat? Uh, are you in the meat industry? Well, I mean, we have cows that we uh, manage holistically that close our nutrient cycle and they are introduced into the whole crop rotation that we have. So therefore, we have a closed loop system. Um, in addition to that, we have over five different syntropic agroforestry systems, which also incorporate livestock, because this is what it comes down to. If we are so intelligent as we as humans believe to be, we would not be paying for something that is being synthetically produced, producing an incredible amount of negative externalities. But we would use the beautiful combination of trees with plants and animals in a sense that works beautifully together, having symbiotic relationships, thereby drastically decreasing the need of any kind of synthetic fertilizer or pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, etc. Because these are being caused and uh, yeah, right, caused but, but, in the first but, place by monocultures. Right, but if, if we're to take uh, that seriously, what you've just described as your uh, production values, then the, the price of food is, is going to have to rise markedly, isn't it? If the whole world were to adopt the practices that you say you adopt in, in your farming system, because it, it's quite an expensive way of producing. And I'm just wondering, I, I, I just want to bring uh, others in. I want to bring Marion in. Marion, do you, you know, do you believe when you look at, uh, at the, from the OECD perspective at how these systems work, do you believe that food uh, is fairly priced or that the pricing system doesn't work, that the, the, the emissions and, and carbon value intrinsic to certain foods isn't actually there so that the consumer isn't really faced with choices that are, you know, sustainable when it comes to their weekly supermarket food shop. What do you think needs to happen in terms of consumption, in terms of the pricing of food? Well, um, coming back to, to uh, uh, Tom, Catherine used uh, externalities, uh, the environmental externalities are, are clearly not fully priced into the system. Um, I would be surprised if anybody um, questions that. So this is currently not the case. Um, we not only are, is the externality not priced in, many countries are still subsidizing fossil fuels. So we are subsidizing uh, some of the, um, of the materials, the ways of production that are damaging for the environment. So um, at OECD, we are looking at these things and we are very actively working on addressing this. We are proposing, for instance, uh, carbon pricing schemes and are discussing this with governments at the international level. These discussions, this, this research, these consultations, this consensus finding is going on as we are speaking. So there is work happening in that direction. It has been too slow over the past years and uh, we need to speed this up. One reason why it is slow is that uh, we are not only dealing here with the facts, uh, facts like agriculture uh, is responsible for part of the uh, carbon emissions, that uh, st still 2 billion of people do not have uh, regular access to sufficiently nutritious food. Uh, we are not only dealing with facts, we are dealing with different interests. And maybe with um, Benedict and Eric, we have two different interest groups here in this discussion. And we are dealing with different values. And the meat uh, example has been mentioned here. Um, in my own family, it's a very active discussion. How much meat? Not at all. What type of meat? Where to buy it? Um, different families, different countries, different societies have different values. So the policymaker needs to find the right answer that the, f the best solution, the best compromise uh, on the basis of facts, and that's where we as OECD have an important role, but trying to compensate these different interests, 
That can sometimes be done through monetary exchanges, but also find the best uh, compromise for the value in your society. And values we cannot necessarily address with money. It's something we can address with information, Benedict uh, referred to this, with uh, education in order to um, inform about the values that as a society we consider to be now the one that represents the full society. And I would like to maybe finish by another point. I do not believe that this is a Northern Hemisphere issue. This problem of climate change has, is very present in the developing and emerging world. Two years ago, I was working, um, Stefan, for a UN organization for the United Nations. So we were working with developing countries. And on a Friday, I was sitting in my office and I just received data from a survey among farmers in the Gambia. And on that same Friday, I was at the phone with my daughters. Now, the survey from the Gambia, a least developed country, showed that over half of the farmers are very concerned about climate change. 40% were taking action, smallhold farmers, to deal with climate change. And the discussion with my daughters at the phone in Switzerland I was living was about whether or not they can participate in the Fridays for Future demonstration. So this is adolescent kids in Switzerland having the same concern as farmers in the least developed countries. This is a global and intergenerational problem. We now have to tackle it. Mm. Okay, thank, thank you, Marion. Uh, I want to bring in another question. I'm going to put this to Karina, then I've got one for Eric. But Karina, you, I, I don't know if this is a fair characterization, but uh, you tell me if you think it's unfair. I think you perhaps represent the most radical voice on our panel. I mean, that, that's not meant in any negative sense <laughs> at all. But, but your opening statement was a, was a declaration that, you know, that the system as it works currently is absolutely not going to solve the problems we face in finding a pathway to uh, a truly sustainable global food system. Uh, and... So the, the, the question that has come up, and I'm going to put it to you, is it's again about meat, uh, but it, it, it's perhaps philosophically an even more broad question. The question is, how can the mass production of meat be changed to reduce its contribution to climate change? So I suppose really it's saying, can the mass production of meat be a part of a long-term sustainable global food system? I wonder whether you are of the view that actually some forms of agriculture just have to be, you know, priced out of existence or, or cancelled altogether. What is your feeling? Absolutely. That is absolutely my view. Uh, I think uh, we need to recognise that the food system, the food economy as we currently have it, uh, was developed in conditions that no longer apply, in conditions where planetary boundaries had not yet been breached and in, in conditions where the, the climate was stable. Uh, in those conditions, we had the fossil fuel companies, we had agribusiness, in particular meat production. We now know that, and, and just to clarify here, Benedict, I'm talking about in, industrial meat production, the kind of the, the worst types, large scale facilities, uh, where feed is imported in rather than in integrated into the landscape, where there's no nutrient cycling. So the, the poster, poster boy for this would be uh, the American feedlot style. So these kinds of companies, that, that, that kind of industrial meat production, in my view, is as incompatible uh, with a sustainable world as coal extraction uh, for, for, for several reasons. Uh, obviously, um, essentially, they produce huge amounts of emissions throughout, you know, producing meat in, the, in, the, in those way, in, the, in, in that way, produces huge amounts of emission. We need feed, uh, typically soy, that's been linked time and time again to deforestation in the Cerrado. Uh, obviously, there's transport, there's methane emissions, and so on. So, in my view, we are moving towards uh, plant-rich diets, uh, not exclusively plant-based diets, but we know that this is the type of agriculture that we need to get rid of altogether. There is no place for a JBS, for a Cargill, uh, in a sustainable uh, world with a stable climate, in my view. Uh, that does not mean that there is no meat at all. 
uh, as, as uh, Benedict has described, there is a place for meat within a regenerative system. Perhaps some, some eggs, perhaps some chickens when they, uh, when they contribute to nutrient cycling. Uh, so do we need to get, get rid of some, some uh, sectors of the, agri uh, of the agricultural sector altogether? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, meat would be, uh, industrial meat uh, is, is at the top of that list. Uh, there are others as well. You know, I can, I can point out to sugar in the UK, for example. We produce vast amounts of sugar in the UK. Uh, it's uh, kind of crazy. It's really, really bad for our soils. It's a crop that is actively bad for us. We are over consuming massively. All adults in the UK over consume sugar and children. It's costing uh, our healthcare system billions. Uh, and we are, uh, it's uh, destroyed our, our bee colonies, uh, and we're producing it uh, to, to generate profit for ABF, uh, a sole monopoly corporation. So yes, we do need to review, you know, what are, what are climate friendly diets? What are diets aligned with uh, the Paris agreements? And what does this mean for existing players uh, in, in agribusiness? But I, I just wonder, you know, how you choose your fights and which hills you choose to die on, because you know, with, with the best will in the world, just saying that industrial meat production needs to be closed down around the world, it, it's a hugely powerful statement, but it's just not going to happen anytime soon. So, I, I, I would disagree. I mean, I would disagree. Uh, I mean, the, the reality is, of course, the idea of having to phase out fossil fuels when that was per, first put forward by environmental activists 20 years ago was dismissed as crazy. We are now uh, closing coal mines. Uh, there are commitments to going fossil fossil fuel free governments and companies are siding up to be net zero um, uh, and decarbonizing the economy uh, it's a natural evolution applying that kind of thinking to high polluting industries and energy to applying it to other sectors in particular food and agribusiness uh, so uh, i really think the choice before us is do we want to keep companies in business that are destroying the planet in business or do we want to start making a plan to phase them out uh, I am highly confident that uh, the, the big meat corporations will go the same way as big oil and big coal. We're already seeing some uh, banks uh, and financial institutions excluding them from their lending portfolios because of deforestation risks and climate risks. Uh, so uh, in terms of which hills to climb on, it, it is quite clear uh, when we think about what is a Paris-aligned diet and what does that mean for dietary change and what are the implications for incumbent players, it is clear which, uh, which sectors of uh, the agricultural and food system need to go. Okay. Well, Karina, very powerful stuff. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Eric, I'm going to bring you back now with a question which actually also relates to what Benedict was saying to you a little bit earlier. I mean, saying through me, I suppose, but I almost want to set up a direct conversation between the two of you. So the, the question is this, um, technology, as you have said in your opening remarks, can play a major role, but the real question is, how will farmers, especially those in the developing world, pay for all of the things that are being talked about, the robotic technologies, the new seeds, all of the stuff that Syngenta Group is working on, as Benedict's pointed out, you're not giving it away for free. You're looking to make healthy profits out of all of this stuff. And in the developing world in particular, farmers have no margin and they're certainly not interested in spending a huge amount of money they can't afford on your new technologies. So how are you going to roll out these technologies in a way that is equitable and sustainable? So, so for, first of all, I would love to the chance to, to meet with you, Benedict, and have a conversation because we're we're open to talking to everybody, and, and, and it's important that we support all farmers around the world. So that, let's just first of all step back and say we, I think we have the same outcome goals uh, that everybody else here has. We want a, a a sustainable world where we can feed headed towards eight billion, headed towards ten billion people, and do it in a way that protects our environment. Uh, we, we want reduced greenhouse gas emissions. We want carbon neutral agriculture. We want less farmland. We want to protect the forests. We want to protect biodiversity. And, and we want less pesticides. We only want pesticides that are needed to be used. So I think there's a lot more commonality than, 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 than you might be hearing right here today, right now. But, but let me talk about this. So let me give you an example. So back in, in fall of 2019, I spent a week in India, uh, w including visiting our, our site there where we're training women in agriculture in India to be agri-entrepreneurs, to help 
local growers grow more food. And, and I visited a farmer, his name is Rajiv. He's a chili pepper farmer. And he, he showed me, we were a bit late because we were visiting many farmers. And we got there at night and, and he, he, he had a flashlight he brought out with him and, and he, he wanted to go out and show me his chili pepper field. And he was telling me about how the higher temperatures in India had decimated his yields and how new seeds from Syngenta had helped revive his yields and he was able to grow successful chili pepper crops. Chili peppers that were bigger, better tasting and got him more money for them. And then he brought me back to his small house. He brought his son out and he put his arm around his son and with tears in his eyes, he said, for he was able to, to send his son, afford to send his son to medical school. And to me, that's what it's all about, helping farmers. And we spend $1.7 billion a year in research. And when we come out with new products, our model is to, to, to make sure that they're more profitable for farmers, that the farmers get more of the benefit than we do. So we, 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 redu we, we came out with a new product called a Depidin, which is a, which is a fungicide to help farmers deal with really important diseases that they have to control. It's used 20% less to have the same benefit or more benefit because some of the diseases are, are, are not controlled by older inse insecticides or pesticides. So we, we, we always try to bring out new technologies that help farmers do better and help the environment. That's what we're committed to. And it's poor farmers around the world and it's in its in farmers in the developed world. Our model is support farmers to do better and protect the environment. Benedict was listening to that very carefully. I was watching it on my screen. He was listening very carefully and there was a wry smile playing on his lips at times. And I wasn't quite sure what that smile meant. So let's find out. Benedict, you, you sort of laid into big corporate agribusiness uh, interests like Syngenta in your opening remarks. Now that you've heard Eric really expand on what he does and what motivates him and how he sees the future of Syngenta's corporation with farmers in the developing world to, to really deliver on affordable, sustainable food system production, do you buy it? Good question. <clears throat> I mean, you know, we... With all honesty, we know we live in a complex world. I think we are all aware of that. And, you know, I think when it comes to companies like Syngenta, you know, it is always easy to say company XYZ is doing this good and that bad. And for sure, you know, they are. There's things that are going well and that we can as a society be grateful for, but there are an incredible amount of things that go bad at this point. And... In the end of the day, you know, it is it is always people. It is the people who change things. It is the people who take responsibility. It is the people who take up and say, okay, I'm going to take a, engage my group of um, managers and my, my employees and convince them of a new way, of a different way, of different uh, needs that we have. And, you know, like... When it comes to on the personal level, you know, I respect Eric absolutely. And he has his role to play and he has his people to please in a sense. So I believe that from the situation that he is in with the interests that he stands for, he believes, um, or you believe, Eric, I can <laughs> directly uh, address you, um, you, you believe what you're doing is right. Um, and that, that, as I said, there's things that, that, that you, that, you are doing right but at the same time you know i think what we need in our day today is humbleness like there is just for everyone noticeable so many things that are going wrong and i would just love for a company like syngenta with that much power to stand up and say look people we have a problem and we are part of that problem but we know what we're doing wrong and there is certain ways of how we can do it better and we, we take a leap of faith, we take responsibility more than just saying, you know, we stand for regenerative agriculture because this is the new word. So I think, you know, saying is easy, doing is more difficult. Um, and I think we, we all, all of us can do more than we say. Um, 
And I think we need more, to be honest with you. But you, know, you know what? This, this reminds me a little bit of the debate we've been having through the pandemic about the, the race to find vaccines and help the world recover from uh, COVID-19. You know, a, a, a big bunch of quote unquote big pharma companies joined the effort to find a vaccine. Now, one of those companies, AstraZeneca, chose to do it pretty much as a non-profit for the duration of the pandemic, but the others, including Pfizer, Moderna, and the rest, hope to turn a tidy profit out of their amazing science and the development of amazing vaccines. But the point is, the profit motive in big pharma is arguably very important to driving the best innovative science. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because the questions come up, uh, and I want uh, maybe Karina to address this, because it, when we're talking about driving more sustainable uh, food production, we do need the very best of cutting edge technologies, the kinds of technologies that Syngenta and many other companies are working upon. And the question that's come in from the audience is, if we got rid of the Syngentas of this world, who would replace what they do? I mean, we need a lot of what they do. So if you're removing the profit motive, the big corporates, who's going to do it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we shouldn't over overstate the role of uh, the private sector necessarily in innovation. Uh, obviously, a lot of research happens in universities, um, you know, as is, as was the case with the AstraZeneca vaccine in terms of that analogy. So I think what businesses do well, what the corporations do well, is is commercializing innovation, right? Is the finding a way to make it profitable, standardizing it, uh, and and finding a way to to distribute it. Um, I think in terms of the where the analogy with the pharmaceutical so pharmaceutical sector falls down a bit is that there's an assumption here that we need um, more innovation in, in the food sector uh, and then the agricultural sector, which I am not sure is the case. Uh, I There are other ways to achieve uh, the goals that um, uh, Eric speaks of in terms of feeding the world, which is obviously what we want to do, uh, and in terms of um, creating space for nature, for rewilding and afforestation. Do we need cutting edge technology to do this? Not necessarily. But the main gains for these goals of feeding the world uh, and uh, making space for nature could be achieved through dietary change, as we've already explored. So through a massive reduction in meat consumption in high income industrialized countries, but also crucially, something we haven't mentioned here at all yet, and it's a big part of the puzzle, through food waste prevention. Uh, so this, you know, this, this is a, by far the lower hanging fruit. Uh, you know, a third of the food that's produced is never eaten with huge environmental impact. So simply halving meat consumption and halving food waste would enable us to massively reduce our emissions. Uh, the UK government's modelling suggests about 88% reduction of, of agricultural emissions uh, while freeing land for afforestation. So we're not necessarily after high-tech solutions, I don't think, uh, when it comes to, to, to food production and ag food production agriculture. We, have, we can put, in focus on diets. We can also focus on food waste prevention first. Yeah. Eric, either you're being very friendly or you want to get in with a comment. But if you do want to get in a comment, make it quick, because I've got something I want to ask Marion, and we're running short of time. So go for it quickly. OK, I believe strongly, we believe strongly in the two points that was just made. Dietary change, very important. And we're supporting with, with breeding technologies, new seeds, to help plant-based meat companies do better, have better tasting products with less ingredients. One, on food waste, we also believe we have to cut down on food waste. One is on the farm, increasing yields on the farm so there's less food waste on the farm. Another example is we're, we're the leaders in the world in tomato seeds. We're now breeding tomato seeds, not just for yield and taste, but also for shelf life. So we're adding one or two weeks of shelf life dramatically reduces the waste in the, in the tomato value chain. Mm. So we're absolutely committed also to dietary change and food waste through innovation that is better for consumers. All right. Th th thank you for that, Eric. I, uh, I want to introduce one more big thought that is, is uh, coming to me because of the pandemic, because of things we've seen through the pandemic. As we watch the vaccine rollout around the world, a lot of us are hoping and praying that international cooperation isn't just rhetorical but becomes real and one of the agencies that may or may not work as a part of that is is the COVAX 
uh, agency which is trying to ensure that vaccination is rolled out to the poorer countries who haven't been able to procure their own supplies of vaccine through the open marketplace because they simply don't have the money but they can be part of a joint collaborative effort largely financed from the rich world to get the vaccine sent out to the to the poorer the, the more disadvantaged nations of the world it, i just wonder whether uh marion whether you see any scope for that sort of Colla genuine cooperative collaborative relationship when it comes to uh, food systems and uh, combating hunger in a sustainable way that is can the rich world which is perhaps better placed to develop sustainable uh, food production systems quickly can it help the poorer parts of the world both by giving technologies if technology is relevant but also, frankly, by redistributing food in a more equitable way. I mean, is this something that is just pie in the sky or, or is it realistic? Um, I think we have seen in this in this pandemic uh, the best and, and maybe also a bit of the worst of international uh, collaboration. We have seen uh, first that um, collaborative processes that we put in place after the great financial crisis have have had a very positive effects during this pandemic. I'm thinking here of the agricultural market information system that was put in place after the great financial price, uh, crisis. It's a simple web portal where you can see the prices of major crops. I'm thinking of rice. I'm, think, I'm thinking of corn. You can see which export restrictions are in place, but also you can see how much of the crop is available on global markets. And when in the beginning of the pandemic, Policymakers started to be nervous, markets started to become jittery, started to think, oh, there will be a shortage of food, uh, prices started to go up. We could show there's no reason for panic. There's enough food around. The harvests have been good. No need for prices to shoot up now. And markets stayed calm in the uh, second and the third quarter of last year. So there we worked together, we had put in place a mechanism after a bad experience, and that mechanism worked. During the COVID-19 crisis, the G20 ministers, I think, have given a very interesting and powerful example. I'm thinking of the trade ministers. They came together three times in one year, and three times they brought together a joint communique. And when you have been working on trade, like I have been doing in the past years, you have gone through a period where trade ministers found it very hard to agree on anything. And there, three times they agreed on a text. Three times they said, if you put measures in place to restrict trade, do it carefully, do it temporarily, keep in mind that it's important for things to stay, keep flowing. There was a real sense of urgency and for need to collaborate. Now, in the vaccine uh, situation, we are not seeing that great um, a, uh, collaboration yet. Here we are in a situation where many, many complicated issues are coming together. Innovation has to um, happen rapidly. That requires investment. The, the new products have to be certified. You have to make a trade-off between how sure are we that this is safe and how many doubts do we still have. There are market players who are, have a certain market power, who are now uh, have a role in distributing the, um, the vaccine. And there are policymakers who quite frankly, have to be responsible, feel they have to be responsible above all for their own voters before they think of others. This is complex, has to be solved very rapidly. The collaboration is not ideal yet. Uh, we very much hope, and at OECD we are supporting uh, this collaboration in order to work together more rapidly because it will be key to solve this global crisis. Yeah, but my, my question is whether we've seen the problems in... in vaccine rollout but but are we realistic to expect in the longer run that given we all agree that that forming a, f finding a pathway to a more sustainable uh, climate change friendly system of food production around the world matters to each and every one of us are we sure that the rich world is prepared to do what it takes to help the poorer parts of the world get to where they need to be I think yes, because as I said before, the, this is an issue uh, that uh, we are all facing around the globe. This is not a north-south issue. And whereas I do think that uh, Benedict and Eric's interests, economic interests, are not necessarily aligned, I do believe that uh, Eric's company has a big interest to uh, start 
uh, to work hard on these environmental questions because it's clear to everybody right now that this problem is urgent. Um, so I do believe there's a sense of urgency. We see policymakers moving across the globe, in the north, in the south, in the west, in the east. We are seeing private sectors playing, players also reacting, and we are seeing consumer organizations, NGO, picking this topic up. Nevertheless, it will be difficult to find a consensus. Um, interests and values are not always aligned. One of the approaches we have had uh, a very positive experience with is, is bringing um, arbitrarily chosen uh, groups of citizens together and have them take decisions on how to align interests and values. So not just discuss on uh, what are our opinions, but tell them, well, you are now, you have to help in taking the decisions, which policy would you introduce? And if you take a randomly well-representative group of citizens, you could, you often can get a situation where you have good representation of the different interests and values in your society that helps you to come to a decision and to design this policy package that helps us to meet environmental objectives, income uh, requirements for farmers and also nutritional objectives for our population. All right. Well, uh, Marion, uh, thank you very much. You just touched on sort of north-south issues, which we're going to touch upon even more in the next few moments. We, we, Unfortunately, panel members, we've run out of time for this panel. I have to say, I found it really stimulating, enjoyable, insightful. I really, really thank you, all four of you, for bringing your experience uh, to this discussion and being not necessarily all on the same page, but discussing it with uh, frankness and great good spirit. So thank you to Marion, to Eric, to Benedict and to Karina. We've really enjoyed your contributions. Thank you all very much indeed. So th th there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Th th I think that really laid out very well the, the, di the different and sometimes challenging perspectives that there are on this issue of how we get to a, a more sustainable uh, food system. And the issue isn't just long term, it is indeed very urgent. Uh, and as Marion was pointing out there, this shouldn't be a sort of north-south, a rich against poor issue. But the fact is that while the industrialized world is historically responsible for most of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world which are causing the climate change uh, which we now all have to take so very seriously. Historically, it is the industrialized world who produced the greenhouse gases, but many of the worst impacts are being felt in the uh, less industrialized, the more developing uh, economy parts of the world, and in particular being felt in food systems, agriculture and rural economy systems in those poorer parts of the world, which is why right now I'm so very pleased to be able to introduce to you our next guest speaker who's going to take us up to our lunch break. Uh, that is Vanessa Nakati. Now, Vanessa is joining us from Kampala. She is a longtime climate activist and she's also the founder of the Rise Up movement. And Vanessa's going to give us some opening thoughts, and then I've got a little bit of time to ask her a couple of questions as well. So, Vanessa, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa Nakate. I am from Kampala, Uganda, a country that has one of the fastest changing climates in the world. Historically, Africa is responsible for only 3% of global emissions. And yet Africans are already suffering some of the most brutal impacts fueled by the climate crisis. Rapidly intensifying hurricanes, devastating floods, and withering droughts. Many Africans have lost their lives, while countless more have lost their homes, farms, and businesses. The droughts and floods have left nothing behind for the people, nothing except for pain, agony, suffering, starvation, and death. We are watching farms collapse and livelihoods lost due to drought, floods, and swarms of locusts. Climate change has disrupted weather patterns in countries like mine, 
causing shorter and heavier rainy seasons and longer dry seasons. Again, farms are being washed away by heavy rains destroying crops and crops are getting burned in intense dry seasons. We saw the locust evasion in countries like Kenya, eating everything they came across in the farms. The climate crisis means hunger and death for many people in my country and across Africa. This is not a hypothetical situation. Food scarcity is an existential threat right now. The climate crisis is leaving millions of people hungry because there is no food. The emissions creating global heating are not just coming from coal-fired power plants and diesel and petrol vehicles. Agriculture and land use together is about 25% of our global emissions. Nitrogen fertilizers for food production threaten our chances to keep global temperatures from rising more than 1.5 or even 2 degrees. The animal agriculture industry alone accounts for up to 15% of global emissions. 83% of the world's cultivatable land is used to feed livestock. Yet livestock only provide 18% of our calories. If we were to change towards a plant-based diet, we could save up, up to 8 billion tons of CO2 a year. Of course, not everyone has the ability to make such changes, but most of us could do something. And it is those who have the most power who also have the most responsibility. We need to drastically cut emissions towards zero starting now. But in addition to reaching zero carbon, we must also reach zero hunger. According to the UN, more than 820 million people did not have enough food to eat in 2018. That is one in every nine people in the world. And that number continues to rise. Some of the key drivers of hunger and food insecurity include conflict, instability, and climate change. Conflict and instability have increased and spiraled, triggering greater population displacement, which leads to a greater demand for food in places where there is already a shortage. On top of this, climate change is affecting agricultural productivity, food production, and natural resources. So the climate crisis is a food crisis, and the food crisis is a humanitarian crisis. There is no climate justice without ensuring that there is food justice. So I say this to the leaders gathered here. Stop investing in fossil fuels. Stop digging up and burning fossil fuels. And stop forcing fossil fuels back into the ground where we grow the food that sustains us. We cannot eat coal and we cannot drink oil. Thank you. Vanessa, thank you very much indeed for that very powerful presentation. I, I know there's a little time delay on this line between me in London and you in Kampala, but I've just got time for one question. And I get the sense from what you said that you don't believe that the leadership in the, in the rich uh, industrialized world is yet shaping up to its responsibilities for the climate crisis and, and not doing enough to help people in Uganda and other parts of the developing world to really cope with the consequences, particularly in terms of food supply. What would you like 
to see the rich world commit to right now? Thank you very much. We all understand the historical events that led to the climate crisis. That is why the developing world cannot be left behind. That is why climate justice cannot only be seen in the developed world. There is no climate justice if it isn't global enough and if it doesn't include everyone. There are solutions that we know can work for people in my countries right now. They may not be moonshot technologies. They may not be rocket science kind of technologies, but they are solutions we believe can work right now. For example, I can talk about one of the projects that I am working on, which I started, and it involves the installation of eco-friendly cookstoves in schools. This is a solution that is already on ground. This is a solution that is already creating change. This is a solution that is keeping students in school. I mean, no child can study on a hungry stomach. And with these eco-friendly stoves, we know that we are providing food, clean food for the students, and also we are saving the planet. So there are a lot of projects, there are a lot of developments that need to be worked on right now, that need to be supported right now so that we can keep students in school, like the Vash Green Schools project. And did you know that keeping girls in school is one of the most powerful solutions that we have to the climate crisis? Project Drawdown lists a hundred solutions that we need to cut global emissions. And listed as number five is educating girls and family planning. But we don't hear about this. Do we see any climate finance directed to educating girls or family planning in the developing world? So we need to, actually leaders need to stop thinking beyond moonshot technologies and think about solutions mm -hmm. that are already working right now, that need to be supported right now, that need to be financed right now on a large scale. We need every solution possible yeah. to be able to yeah. fight the climate crisis because with the climate crisis, then there is no food security. Vanessa, you, you speak incredibly powerfully and you come up with some really concrete examples and solutions as well. So uh, I thank you on behalf of everybody involved in the Forum on the Future of Agriculture. Thanks so much for joining us from Kampala today. We really, really enjoyed your contribution. Thank you very much indeed. It was my pleasure. Well, I'm so glad that we were able to hear from Vanessa Nakati. At the end of a fascinating discussion, which, let us be honest, involved corporate leaders, think tank leaders, uh, obviously a, a, a farmer from the um, you know, prosperous European perspective, albeit a farmer with some real problems and some very interesting thoughts about the future. It was, I think, very important to wrap up this element of our FFA, which is devoted to making food systems more resilient in terms of climate change. It was important to hear from Kampala and to get the terrific input of Vanessa there. So uh, it's been such a fascinating discussion for me to chair this morning. I hope you've enjoyed it too. We're pretty much uh, out of time before lunch, but before we break for lunch, a final word from Mark. Great, thank you, Stephen. Uh, well, terrific morning. I mean, um, you couldn't get more, I think, wrapped into it than what we've had. And, and I think what we heard from Vanessa there at the end is, Certainly what struck me is, you know, it's, it's from the abstract to the reality. I mean, she, she absolutely nails it on the head. We're, we talk sometimes in forums like these hypothetically, but what's happening on the ground is, uh, is very real to, 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 to people like Vanessa. 
And of course, the panel session, as you said, I mean, we could have let that run. I mean, it was so engrossing. Um, and, and some of the arguments that we heard were pretty provocative. Um, and yet, as I think one of the panelists said, you know, it, it is a complex world and it's probably not either or. There is good and bad and what we all do as individuals and as organizations. So a, a thoroughly stimulating morning. And again, thank you to you, Stephen, for your moderation. Um, that does pretty much wrap things up for the morning. Um, hopefully you're uh, stimulated by all of that. If you're not, nothing will do it. Um, it is lunchtime now here in Central Europe, maybe even just slightly after lunch. Um, so we encourage you to uh, take a break now and step again into the exhibition zone. Plenty of our uh, partners and supporters there to, to nourish you with their ideas, if that's uh, what you want, and also in the networking zone. And for the eagle-eyed of you on the platform, you will notice that we have a kitchen that is available for uh, you to virtually um, enter and peruse. There are recipes there that are healthy, nutritious, and tasty, and also sustainable, I'm told, uh, and some show cooking as well to inspire you further. So off you go, enjoy your break. We'll be back here at 1.30 Central European time, I think that's right, 1.30 Central European time, where we will be looking at healthy food for all at scale. Bye for now. <laughs>